Chapter 2, Part 1 of The Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Outscheller. Chapter 2 The Foot Cavalry. Part one. Captain Shelburne told Captain McGee that the invaders were coming and there was a stir in the ranks of the defenders. The cavalrymen, disciplined and eager, said nothing, but merely moved a little in order to see better along the road over which the enemy was advancing. The original defenders, who were infantry, talked in whispers, despite commands, and exchanged doubts and apprehensions. Harry walked up and down in front of the warehouse with Captain Sherburne, and both watched the road. "'If we only had a little artillery, just a light gun or two, said Sherburne, we'd give them such a surprise that they'd never get over it. "'But we haven't got it. No, we haven't. But maybe rifles and carbines will serve.' The hoofbeats were fast growing louder and Harry knew that the head of the northern column would appear in a minute or two. Every light in the warehouse or about it, and all in the village, had been extinguished, but the moonlight was clear, and more stars had come into the full sky. "'We can see well enough for a fight,' murmured Captain Sherbert. Everybody could hear the hoofbeats now, and again there was a stir in the ranks of the defenders. The dark line appeared in the road three or four hundred yards away, and then, as the horsemen emerged into the open, they deployed rapidly by companies. They, too, were trained men, and keen eyes among their officers caught sight of the armed dark line before the warehouse. The voice of the trumpet suddenly pealed forth again, and now it was loud and menacing. "'It's the charge!' cried Sherburne. And I can see that they're all you said, Kenton, a magnificent body, truly. Ready, men, ready. For God's sake, don't fire too soon. Wait for the word, wait for the word. He was all the leader now, and in the excitement of the moment, McGee did not notice it. The superior mind, the one keen to see and to act, was in control. Here, Kenton, cried Sherburne, hold back these recruits. My own men will do exactly as I say. Harry ran along the infantry line, and here and there he knocked down rifles which were raised already, although the enemy was yet three hundred yards away. But he saw a figure in front of the charging horseman wave a sword. Then the trumpet blew another call, short but fierce and menacing, and the ground thundered as nearly a thousand horsemen swept forward, uttering a tremendous shout, their sabers flashing in the moonlight. Harry felt a moment of admiration, and then another moment of pity. These men, charging so grandly, did not know that the defenders had been reinforced, nor did they know that they rode straight to what was swift and sudden death for many of them. It was hard to stand steady and not pull the trigger, while that line of flashing steel galloped upon them. But the dismounted cavalrymen looked to their leader for commands, and the officer held the infantry. Harry's moment of admiration and pity passed. These were soldiers coming to defeat and destroy, and it was his business to help prevent it. His own pulse of battle began to beat hard. That front of steel, spread wide across the open, was within two hundred yards now, then a hundred and fifty, then a hundred, then less, and fierce and sharp like the crack of a rifle came Captain Sherburne's command, Fire! Four hundred rifles leaped to the shoulder, and four hundred fingers pressed triggers so close together that four hundred rifles sang together as one. The charge halted in its tracks. The entire front rank was shot away. Horses and men went down together, and the horses uttered neighs of pain far more terrific than the groans of the wounded men. Many of them, riderless, galloped up and down between the lines. But the splendid horsemen behind came on again after the momentary stop. Half of them armed with short carbines sent a volley at the defenders. 
who were shoving in cartridges in frantic haste, and the swordsmen galloped straight upon the Virginians. Harry saw a great saber flashing directly in his face. It was wielded by a man on a powerful horse that seemed wild with the battle fever. The horse at the moment was more terrible than his rider. His mouth was dripping with foam, and his lips were curled back from his cruel white teeth. His eyes, large and shot with blood, were like those of some huge, carnivorous animal. The boy recoiled, more in fear of the horse than of the saber, and snatching a heavy pistol from his belt, fired directly at the great foam-flecked head. The horse crashed down, but his rider sprang clear and retreated into the smoke. Almost at the same instant the defenders had fired the second volley, and the charge was beaten back from their very faces. The Southerners at the war's opening had the advantage of an almost universal familiarity with the rifle, and now they used it well. Sherburne's two hundred men, always cool and steady, fired like trained marksmen, and the others did almost as well. Most of them had new rifles, using cartridges, and no cavalry on earth could stand before such a fire. Harry again saw the flashing sabers more than once, and there was a vast turmoil of fire and smoke in front of him, but in a few minutes the trumpet sounded again, loud and clear over the crash of battle, and now it was calling to the men to come back. The two forces broke apart. The horsemen, save for the wounded and dead, retreated to the forest, and the defenders, victorious for the present, fired no more, while the wounded, who could, crawled away to shelter. They reloaded their rifles, and at first there was no exultation. They barely had time to think of anything. The impact had been so terrible, and there had been such a blaze of firing, that they were yet in a daze, and scarcely realized what had happened. "'Down, men, down!' cried Captain Sherburne, as he ran along the line. "'They'll open fire from the wood!' All the defenders threw themselves upon the ground and lay there, much less exposed, and also concealed, partly. One edge of the wood ran within two hundred yards of the warehouse, and presently the northern soldiers, hidden behind the trees at that point, opened a heavy rifle fire. Bullets whistled over the heads of the defenders, and kept up a constant patter upon the walls of the warehouse, but did little damage. A few of the men in gray had been killed, and all the wounded were taken inside the warehouse, into which the great tobacco barn had been turned. Two competent surgeons attended to them by the light of candles, while the garrison outside lay still and waiting under the heavy fire. A waste of lead, said Sherburne to Harry. They reckon perhaps that we're all recruits, and will be frightened into retreat. Or surrender. If we had those guns now, we could clear out the woods in short order, said Harry. And if they had them, they could soon blow up this barn and everything in it, and a lot of us at the same time. So we are more than even on the matter of lack of guns. The fire from the wood died in about fifteen minutes, and was succeeded by a long and trying silence. The light of the moon deepened and silvered the faces of the dead lying in the open. All the survivors of the attack were hidden, but the defenders knew that they were yet in the forest. Kenton, said Captain Sherbert, you know the way to General Jackson's camp at Winchester. I've been over it a dozen times. Then you must mount and ride. This force is sitting down before us for a siege, and it probably has pickets about the village, but you must get through somehow. Bring help. The Yankees are likely to send back for help, too, but we've got to win here. I'm off in five minutes, said Harry, and I'll come with a brigade by dawn. I believe you will, said Sherburne. But get to old Jack. Get there. If you can only reach him, we're saved. He may not have any horsemen at hand, but his foot cavalry can march nearly as fast. 
Lord, how Stonewall Jackson can cover ground. Their hands met in the hearty grasp of a friendship which was already old and firm, and Harry, without looking back, slipped into the wood where the men from the village were watching over the horses. Sherburne had told him to take any horse he needed, but he chose his own, convinced that he had no equal, slipped into the saddle, and rode to the edge of the wood. "'There's a creek just back of us. You can see the water shining through the break in the trees,' said a man who kept the village store. "'The timber's pretty thick along it, and you'd best keep in its shelter. Here, you, Tom, show him the way.' A boy of fourteen stepped up to the horse's head. "'My son,' said the storekeeper, "'he knows every inch of the ground.' But Harry waved him back. "'No,' he said. "'I'll be shot at, and the boy on foot can't escape. "'I'll find my way through. "'No, I tell you, he must not go.' He almost pushed back the boy, who was eager for the task, rode out of the wood which was on the slope of the hill away from the point of attack, and gained the fringe of timber along the creek. It was about fifty yards from cover to cover, but he believed he had not been seen, as neither shout nor shot followed him. Yet the Union pickets could not be far away. He had seen enough to know that the besiegers were disciplined men led by able officers. They would certainly make a cordon around the whole southern position. He rode his horse into a dense clump of trees and paused to listen. He heard nothing but the faint murmur of the creek and the occasional rustle of dry branches as puffs of wind passed. He dismounted for the sake of caution and silence as far as possible and led his horse down the fringe of trees, always keeping well under cover. Another hundred yards and he stopped again to listen. All those old inherited instincts and senses leapt into life. He was, for the moment, the pioneer lad, seeking to detect the ambush of his foe. Now his acute ears caught the hostile sound. It was low, merely the footsteps of a man, steadily walking back and forth. Harry peeped from his covert and saw a Union sentinel not far away, pacing his beat, rifle on shoulder, the point of the bayonet tipped with silver flame from the moon. And he saw further on another sentinel, and then another, all silent and watchful. He knew that the circle about the defense was complete. He could have escaped easily through the line had he been willing to leave his horse, and for a few moments he was sorely tempted to do so. But he recalled that time was more precious than jewels. If he ever got beyond the line of pickets, he must go and go fast. He was three or four hundred yards from the village, and no one had yet observed him, but he did not believe that he could go much further undetected. Someone was bound to hear the heavy footsteps of the horse. The creek shallowed presently, and the banks became very low. Then Harry decided suddenly upon his course. He would put everything to the touch, and win or lose in one wild dash. Springing upon the back of his horse, he raked him with the spur and put him straight at the creek. The startled animal was across in two jumps, and then Harry sent him racing across the field. He heard two or three shouts and several shots, but fortunately none touched him or his mount, and, not looking back, he continually urged the horse to greater speed. Bending low, he heard the distant sound of hoofbeats behind him, but they soon died away. Then he entered a belt of forest and when he passed out on the other side, no pursuit could be seen. But he did not slacken speed. He knew that all Sherburne had said about Stonewall Jackson was true. He would forgive no dallying by the way. He demanded of every man his uttermost. He turned from the unfenced field into the road and rode at a full gallop toward Winchester. A cold wind swept past, and his spirits rose high. Every pulse was beating with exultation. It was he who had brought the warning to the defenders of the stores. It was he who had brought Sherburne's troop to help beat off the attack. And now it was he who, bursting through the ring of steel, was riding to Jackson and sure relief. 
his horse seemed to share his triumph he ran on and on without a swerve or jar once he stretched out his long head and uttered a shrill neigh the sound died in far echoes and then followed only the rapid beat of his hoofs on the hard road harry knew that there was no longer any danger to him from the enemy and he resolved now not to go to his own colonel but to ride straight to the tent of jackson himself the night had never grown dark moon and star still shed an abundant light for the flying horseman and presently he caught fleeting glimpses through the trees of roofs that belonged to winchester then two men in gray sprang into the road and leveling their rifles gave him the command to stop i'm lieutenant kenton of the invincibles he cried and i've come for help a strong force of the yankees is besieging hertford and four hundred of our men are defending it there is no time to waste they must have help there before dawn or everything is lost which way is general jackson's tent in that field on the hillock replied one of the men pointing two or three hundred yards away harry raced toward the tent which rose in modest size out of the darkness and sprang to the ground when his horse reached it a single sentinel rifle across his arms was standing before it but the flap was thrown back and a light was burning inside i'm a messenger for general jackson cried harry i've news that can't wait the sentinel hesitated a moment but a figure within stepped to the door of the tent and harry for the first time was face to face with stonewall jackson he had seen him often near or far but now he stood before him and was to speak with him jackson was dressed fully and the fine wrinkles of thought showed on his brow as if he had intended to study and plan the night through he was a tallish man with good features cut clearly high brow short brown beard and ruddy complexion his uniform was quite plain and his appearance was not imposing but his eyes of deep blue regarded the boy keenly i'm lieutenant kenton sir of colonel talbot's invincibles replied harry to the question which was not spoken but which nevertheless was asked our arsenal at hertford is besieged by a strong force of the enemy a force that is likely to be increased heavily by dawn luckily captain sherburne and his troop of valley virginians came up in time to help and i have slipped through the besieging lines to bring more aid harry had touched his cap as he spoke and now he stood in silence while the blue eyes looked him through i know you i have observed you said jackson in calm even tones showing not a trace of excitement i did not think that the federal troops would make a movement so soon but we will meet it a brigade will march in half an hour don't i go with it exclaimed harry pleadingly you know i brought the news sir you do your regiment will form part of the brigade rejoin colonel talbot at once the invincibles with you as guide shall lead the way you have done well lieutenant kenton harry flushed with pride at the brief words of praise which meant so much coming from stonewall jackson and saluting again hurried to his immediate command already the messengers were flying to the different regiments bidding them to be up and march at once the invincibles were upon their feet in fifteen minutes fully clothed and armed and ready for the road the cavalry were not available that night and the brigade would march on foot save for the officers harry was back on his horse and st clair and langdon were beside him the colonels talbot and st hilaire sat on their horses at the head of the invincibles the first regiment what is it said langdon to harry have you brought this night march upon us i have and we're going to strike the yankees before dawn at hertford replied harry to both questions i like the nights for rest said langdon but it could be worse i've had four hours sleep anyway you'll have no more this night that's certain said st clair look general jackson himself is going with us 
See him climbing upon little sorrel? Lord pity the foot cavalry. General Jackson, mounted upon the sorrel horse, destined to become so famous, rode to the head of the brigade, which was now in ranks, and beckoned to Harry. I've decided to attend to this affair myself, Lieutenant Kenton, he said. Keep by my side. You know the way. Be sure that you lead us right. His voice was not raised, but his words had an edge of steel. The cold blue eyes swept him with a single chilly glance, and Harry felt the fear of God in his soul. Lead them right. His faculties could not fail, with Stonewall Jackson by his side. The general himself gave the word. The brigade swung into the broad road, and it marched. It did not dawdle along. It marched, and it marched fast. It actually seemed to Harry after the first mile that it was running, running toward the enemy. End of chapter 2, part 1 Recording by Bill Mosley, Bernardo, Texas, USA